NASA. Probably makes you think space. Well, turns out it should also make you think green. Today we're at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab in Houston exploring a very cool green project. Marlon, tell me what this is all about. What is this Neutral Buoyancy Lab? What do people do here? Well, this is where the astronauts simulate zero gravity. Anytime they do a EVA in the space shuttle, they test here probably about a dozen times so that when they go up there, they're familiar with what it is they're asked to do. And then there's a, like, a replica of the International Space Station underwater here? Yes, yes. Okay. They, so is this the same type of suit that they wear in outer space, like on the same sort of system? How, how does it differ? It's the same suit. And is it really heavy? Could you just jump into it and run around the pool? Or? The suit itself dry weight is about 300 pounds. Okay. So very... They actually put it in with, with the cranes that you see behind us. Oh, no kidding. And, and tell me, is it different from normal scuba? Is the same air, the same sort of, like, the, the breathing apparatus similar or different? We're breathing nitrox here, 46% uh, enriched oxygen versus the 20% that we're breathing right now. Okay. And with that is some added risk. Our challenge is with the enriched oxygen of 46% to keep our system clean to eliminate any possible fires. Oh, I get it. So any particles that get in the astronaut's suit or the scuba gear can spark and ignite a fire even underwater because the oxygen is so pure. A absolutely, absolutely. We'd use outside vendors in the past yep. for cleaning and we came to the conclusion that we could do it as well in-house and we wanted to be more environmentally friendly. And we've established our own clean room to meet that challenge. Can you take me on a little tour through that? Oh, I'd love to. Let's go. All right. So Marlon, tell me, what, what do we got here? Graham, this is a yoke that we use to fill our scuba bottles, and as an example, this is one of the pieces of equipment that we have to maintain a specific cleanliness level. Okay. And this happens to be the piece that we have in the clean room right now that we were going to show you as an example of how to clean this. So why do we have to put these all on? This is a security that, that we have to wear to maintain the cleanliness level of our clean room. Your body is constantly shedding itself. And there's particles releasing from your body constantly. You're ready. If you have a goatee, then you have to wear one of these. Much less beanie. So what we're going to see next is the steps they take here at NASA to really clean the equipment in order to ensure there's absolutely no particles left that might ignite. This is the valve we just looked at in our scuba fill area. We're going to disassemble this, yep. take off all the visual stuff that we can see before we actually enter the clean room. And we just basically scrub any kind of particles or any kind of hydrocarbons off of the component. This is the first phase. This is like getting the, the, the big dirt Absolutely, off. that's and exactly. What, 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 what is the stuff that comes out of here? Just water? This has just got a little bit of detergent and DI water. So it's, a, it's ecologically friendly enough you just, you just pour it down the sewer? Absolutely. OK, all right. Let's see phase two. Let's go. All right, so we're in the clean room with Mr. Dennis Casey. Um, tell me, first of all, I've never been in the clean room. What, what's the deal here? This is a process called ultrasonics, where we bathe the part and subject it to high frequency sound, and that helps to break up the particles. Oh, so okay. That... okay, so we're over here at phase three, and because the camera can't come in the clean room, we're gonna have to describe what's happening. In this phase of our cleaning, we use a specialized solvent, and this machine allows us to retain the solvent without allowing it to escape into the environment. Down in the vat, there's a boiling material in which the parts are submerged. Okay. So it's basically two levels. The bottom half is this boiling solvent, and then a cooling half. And so the solvent, instead of just going off into the air, ends up condensing when it hits the cool part and back in. So it becomes totally cyclical. Phase four, which is dance is just starting, is testing to make sure the stuff's clean. You don't actually test the parts, you just run a little solution over the part into one of these beakers, and then we're gonna test it in the, the special lab thing over here. This is the material that we bathed the part in, and to determine whether the part is clean, we're gonna actually test the solvent. Nerve-wracking. It, it looks pretty clean. 
No? Let's see about that. Okay, so phase five, how does it work? Well, this is where we actually test for hydrocarbons. In this process in which we could evaporate a large amount of material to get our reading, we only use a small amount, about three milliliters versus 150. Wow. And that, that gives us our, our reading that we require for our cleanliness level. So people just use, used to use 150, now they're using three. So this is the greenest part in a very green green process. Yeah. Thanks a ton for leading me through my first clean room and uh, I think it's time for a swim. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. You don't think so? How great to see a big government agency incorporating green as a criterion and also just to see how green can be applied into so many weird different little sections of life. Graham Hill, Houston, see you next time.